We are less than two weeks out from Election Day, and a number of new battleground state polls are showing a deadlocked race between Vice President Kamala Harris and former President Donald Trump. Trump appears to have some momentum in the polls, but the race is still very much within the margin of error. Meanwhile, in battleground states North Carolina and Georgia, voters are breaking early voting records, but it's unclear which party that will benefit come Election Day. It's time to go on the record with Scott Tranter, Director of Data Science for Decision Desk HQ. Scott, I know we are working around the clock. Your schedule is crazy. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to jump right into it. At the beginning of October, eight out of the uh, eight of the presidential forecasts you have been tracking had Harris between what 50 to 60 percent chance of winning. But now six of those eight forecasts showed Trump slightly favored to win. We know that each forecast has different methodologies and how they weigh partisan polling, but do you think a recent influx of right-leaning or Republican-leaning polling could have much of an impact on the forecast? A lot of Democrats I talk to say it could. Yeah, no, the reason why I point out eight is these eight have different methodologies on how they treat those partisan polls. Some don't even include them, some downweight them, some include them wholesale. And so that's kind of the key is it's not just it's not just one um, potentially partisan forecast or average moving that direction. It's all of them. Um, and, th and that's the trend we're looking for. That's consistent across all, pretty much every polling average and every forecast out there. I want to zero in on some of the efforts the Trump campaign is making, including a number of Trump allies, namely Elon Musk. He's been on the campaign trail for the former president, has even pledged to pay up to $1 million each day to a new Pennsylvania voter who signs the America PAX petition to support free speech and the right to bear arms. We know that this has stirred up a lot of backlash from Democrats and, quite frankly, a lot of people in the legal community. But what impact is this having on Trump's campaign? I mean, is this making any movement in Pennsylvania? You know, we're going to have to see next week when we see the registration totals in Pennsylvania come out and see if there's any spike uh, uh, among anything. The nuance with Elon Musk thing is all he was saying is sign of perdition. So he could be registering Democrats, could be registering independents. We'll have to see more next week. It certainly got a lot of press attention. Um, I, I don't know whether it'll make a dent or not. Um, but we're going to have the data in a week, so we'll have a better idea. So, Scott, moving to the Harris campaign, we've heard a lot of concerns in recent weeks about her weaknesses in the polls with young Black and Latino men. But Harvard's polling director wrote in a New York Times op-ed this week that Trump's focus on this demographic and young men in general is posing a threat to Harris and Democrats. So how big of a problem does Harris have with young men? It, she has one. Look, every single poll we've seen over the last month in the cross tabs. Um, have shown this trend. It's something we were talking about six months ago. We weren't sure whether it was going to persist, but uh, pretty much nationally in every single state, we see that. Conversely, we see that she has got a pretty big lead and gap above Donald Trump among women. So this is something that, you know, is going to change the electoral math and the vocals for each of them. We'll see how it balances out, but it's certainly so, uh, a phenomenon that um, we, we noticed earlier this year and is definitely going to play a, a role in next week's election. You know, another demographic that Harris seems to have some issues with is Arab American voters. You know, some polls show that, you know, a, a sizable amount of Arab Americans are unhappy with the administration's handling of the war in Gaza and the war in, Middle East, in the Middle East. But a new Arab News YouGov poll shows that 45 percent of the demographic said they are most likely going to vote for Trump, while 43 percent said they would vote for Harris. That's just one poll. There's others that paint a slightly different picture. But Michigan, as we know, has the highest concentration of Arab Americans in the United States. So, Scott, um, what are her chances in Michigan? We know that it's not just Arab Americans that are deciding this vote in Michigan. You also have a number of blue collar union vote voters, just a lot of very important demographics. Yeah, look, that that is not the number you want to see if you're the Harris camp out of Arab Americans, especially considering Donald Trump has gotten a few high profile um, endorsements among local Arab American community leaders. Um, it, it, it certainly makes it a tough uphill battle for her in a state that's projected to be decided by tens of thousands of votes. Um, that combined with, you know, as you mentioned, African-American men, 
um, Latinos, um, you know, it's it's certainly going to change the math for it. the only upside for is Michigan, 80 percent um, white Caucasian. She is doing better amongst women. And so that's going to that's a little bit of the math in her favor. But this is why it's so close. We're not exactly sure how the, how all these different um, uh, number shifts and trend shifts are, are, are going to play out for each individual candidate, given it's so close. You know, I want to move to the summit map now and an interesting piece that our colleague at the Hill, Alex Bolton, has out that looks at how Senate candidates in blue wall states, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, seem to be running away from Harris on the campaign trail and not re- trying not to bring her up. How much of this is about winning, winning over Trump supporters who could vote for Trump, but uh, also vote for a Democrat at the Senate level? Or is this about Harris being, you know, potentially toxic on some some level to some of these swing voters? I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, look, relatively speaking, she is a newer candidate. So if you were a voter on the fence, you, you, you want to see more. It's only in the recently a couple of weeks she started to do interviews. And, you know, Donald Trump, he's been essentially running for president for 10 years. So uh, I, I think you're looking at some reticence of voters. But I also think some of these Senate candidates Look, we see some of the split ticket that you reference. I think at the end of the day, if you're going to vote for the Democratic Senate ticket at the top, um, you're also going to vote for the Democratic presidential ticket. I don't see a whole lot of a reverse uh, split ticket, as they put it, coming coming down to the wire. Sticking with the blue wall, a number of the governors from those states, including Pennsylvania's Josh Shapiro, Michigan's Gretchen Whitmer, and Wisconsin Tony Evers, have hit the campaign trail in recent days to campaign for Harris in the region. Uh, Scott, do these governors have strong enough brands to carry Harris over the edge, or is this a small part of a bigger effort? Um, I, I th- it certainly helps. Look, they're, they're draw. These, these Democratic governors, each in their own right, at some point, maybe T- Tony Evers less so, but two of those governors were considered, you know, uh, presidential candidates and probably will be considered presidential contestants, uh, contenders over the next one or two cycles. Um, so they carry a lot. What I think it most helps with is when you're a governor of a state, you get uh, a pretty large campaign apparatus to control with the state party. You have the ability to raise money. You obviously have a proven organization because you were put in office by the organization. I think that is extremely valuable um, uh, and an advantage for the Democrats in each of these states, especially since the Democrats are out raising uh, the Republicans, both at the Senate level and at the presidential level. You know, in the last two weeks of the election, we see that Democrats seem to be zeroing in on Trump's response to the January 6th attack on the Capitol and this you know, future of democracy. Uh, Liz Cheney was campaigning with Harris earlier this week and brought this up, along with um, the question of abortion rights. Scott, do you think this effort to um, you know, talk about these two issues could help Democrats win over key swing voters in some of these battleground states? Well, here's what I do know. Those are the two issues in which Kamala Harris holds the best. She's not talking about the economy. She's not talking about the border. Those are the top two issues amongst voter minds. But Donald Trump edges her out in those two issues. Um, uh, Women's reproductive rights um, and, you know, defending democracy, January 6th stuff. That's where she polls better. So she's at least going to close on the two issues that voters trust her and and, uh, think she's best able to handle. We're seeing that Democrats seem to be growing increasingly worried about Green Party candidate Jill Stein and, you know, if she could be an election spoiler. We know that back in 2016, she's been blamed in part for Hillary Clinton's loss. But we see that the Democratic National Committee is launching a series of billboards in Wisconsin and Arizona attacking Stein. So are these uh, fears and concerns from Democrats uh, valid? And which states do you think Stein could cause the most damage? Well, I I mean, look, the fears are there because this race is so close. So even a half a point going to the Green Party that could otherwise go to the Democrats, they're worried about. Um, I think Michigan is probably a pretty big worry. But by and large, my expectation is, is the Green Party and Jill Stein will be sub 2 percent, sub sub her polling there. Um, And could it make a difference? Absolutely. Mathematically, it could take a difference, make a difference. But at this point, Jill Stein, man, this is probably the second or third, fourth time she's run for president. There's nothing the Democrats can do but run their own campaign at this point. 
So as of this week, almost 18 million people have cast their ballots early. When you break it down by party, Republicans made up 39% of in-person and almost 34% of mail-in ballots. Uh, compared to la past elections, uh, you know, this is definitely a noticeable increase, and we're seeing Republican messaging on this certainly change. Um, look, do you, who does this benefit at the end of the day? Because I've heard that Democrats still could potentially have an edge. Yeah, look, I think uh, on one hand, people are surprised that Republicans are voting early because this is a trend shift from 2020. Um, but as you and I have talked about in the past, the Republican Party and Donald Trump specifically has been pushing their voters to come out early. And so I'm, I'm not surprised to see elevated levels of GOP participation in comparison to 2020. What I'm looking for, are they getting brand new voters out to vote? Um, and we're seeing a little bit of that in places like Georgia, places like Nevada, but we're not seeing um, yet. It could be. We still have, you know, 10, 15 days to go in a lot of these states. We're not seeing it yet a huge surge here. But I do think the gap between Republicans and Democrats in terms of early vote will be significantly smaller this cycle than what we saw in 2020. So I want to move our direction to uh, Harris's campaign schedule this week. She's making a stop in Houston this week, calling Texas ground zero for Trump's abortion bans. Um, she's also going to be campaigning with Beyonce herself, a Houston native. But look, why is Harris heading to Texas right now um, in addition to the other battleground states? I mean, Texas is a pretty red leaning state. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to me, you know, Colin Allred and our forecast um, is an underdog there. Ted Cruz is favored to win. And Ted Cruz has had some some decent polling that's improved his odds over the last um, couple of weeks as well. I think, um, you know, look, she's got that Beyonce concert. Beyonce's from Houston. Um, it's good fundraising. There is a Senate nexus there. Um, she's going to get national press attention no matter what city she's in. Um, so I think this is probably uh, more for a national play, especially considering you, she's going to get a, a, a singer like Beyonce. Um, but it is a little bit quixotic down the end. Yeah, and I want to stick with Texas for a moment because, you know, at the same time, at the Senate level, a new Emerson College, the Hill Poll, shows Senator Ted Cruz and Congressman Colin Allred basically in a virtual dead heat. Allred and Harris have focused heavily on abortion. Do you think this is issue is enough to make inroads for Democrats in the state or potentially even flip it? Yeah, look, I, 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 you know, those polls are good. This is why I like averages. I think you, you just flashed up the average. Ted Cruz is three points ahead. He last time he ran, he only won by two point six. So he's out, his polling's outperforming his last performance. I will say this: if the Democrats flip Texas, which I don't think is likely, it will be because of issues like that. You know, issues that voters think they're strong on, and so at least they are putting their best um, issue on the table um, in a state that they're trying to flip. But I don't know that it's gonna it's gonna work out this time. Demographically, Texas, 10, 15 years from now, going to be a battleground state, but I think it's still got a ways to go. Well, we'll be watching uh, election night to see what happens there. Scott Tranter, as always, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. And that's it for What's America Thinking. I'm Julia Manchester. Come back next week and be sure to like, share, and subscribe to The Hills YouTube channel.